introduction, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining me today as a, in part of a curatorial conversation um, for the Zuckerman Museum of Art. Um, I'm really grateful that you took the time in this unprecedented time amidst COVID-19. Um, I feel like because we're all in new working environment and most of us have or work for spaces that are physically closed to the public, it's a really great time to connect with the community and to learn strategies. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing myself and I'd like each of you to introduce yourself briefly. Um, and then I have a prompt I'm going to lead into from there. Um, so my name is Ginger Wolf Suarez. Um, my role at the Zuckerman Museum of Art is as a senior curator. And I'm interim director of curatorial affairs. Um, I attended grad school at UC Berkeley and I relocated recently from California to Atlanta. Um, some of my research interests include feminist archives, um, as well as the relationship between environmentalism, agriculture, and conceptual art practices, as well as performative actions. Um, so that's some of the um, work I'm doing now from home. Um, and now I'm going to shift over to Nzinga. Nzinga, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Nzinga. Um, I'm originally from New York, um, but I currently reside in Atlanta. Um, I'm currently the Tina Dunkley Curator. Tina Dunkley Curator Fellow in American Art um, at, for Clark, at Clark Atlanta University Art Museum. Um, so that was like a two year um, curatorial fellowship and the culminating project was an exhibition that I'm sure we can talk more about now. Um, but yeah, I'm an emerging curator, arts writer um, and art history scholar based in Atlanta. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to introduce Emily Knight um, Emily um, is a graduate of KSU and prior to coming back to work for the Zuckerman Museum of Art, where I am one of her mentors, proudly, um, she worked at um, the muse at MOCA, Georgia, where she ran a lot of really interesting programs there. Um, she's also handling some of the technology in this call, so I just wanted to introduce her. Um, can we then move to you, Doris, again? Yes. I am Dorisia Mwadimar. I'm an independent curator and creative entrepreneur. I'm the founder of Thai Arts Projects. Um, I'm consulting and co-founder of Black Women in Visual Arts. I attended, graduated from GSU with art history degree and NYU in arts administration. I work between Atlanta and New York City. Great. Thank you so much for being here and for joining. Thank you. I've been trying to get Dorisia involved with ZMA in many ways, so I'm so glad that she's been able to join today. Um, can I shift over to Erin Dunn now? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Dunn. I'm the Associate Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at Telfair Museums. Um, I've worked there for about six years. I started as a fellow um, and then joined as Assistant Curator. Uh, and I mostly work with exhibitions focusing on the permanent collection, um, specifically uh, really interested in working with the photography collection, looking at kind of the intersections of social and cultural issues in photography. Um, can we switch over to Hannah Israel now? Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Hannah Israel. I am the gallery. Director at, in the Ilgis Gallery at Columbus State University, where I also am a professor of art. Um, and I'm also a practicing artist and, and a mom. <laughs> you know, we juggle all these things together. So I'm really pleased to be here with all of you guys. Um, I recently saw Hannah's space for the first time, and I was so impressed with the rigor of the program. Um, and I wanted to also say um, Hannah just um, shared a project with her students today, um, which was a public art project right on the river walk. It was really, I think, an interesting example of coming to new conclusions and coming up with new ideas. So congratulations on that. Hannah. Yeah. And, and that was really a community effort. And, you know, without community support, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it. But I'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, great. And can we now move to Katie? Katie, can you introduce yourself? Hi, yes, thanks for having me. I'm Katie Hirsch. I'm curator and director of strategic partnerships at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. 
And I've been there uh, almost four years now. And along with my colleagues at the Halsey, I really enjoy uh, bringing artists to present new bodies of work. And um, as a personal curatorial interest, I, I enjoy working with artists who explore issues of indigeneity and uh, the concept of othering. That sounds amazing. Well, thank you. This seems like a really great group. Thank you so much for taking the time to join. Um, I wanted to start by just sharing that um, it's been pretty hard and pretty unprecedented working at home, managing our respective institutions. Um, and I never thought I would be managing an institution that is not physically open to the public. Um, and so I've come up with um, different strategies and different ways of working. Um, as a mom, too, I'm home with two children. It makes me think a lot about labor and how labor is visible. Um, but I was wondering if there are any strategies um, any of you could share about how you're coping with this moment and, and coming up with conclusions as a curator that are actually helpful to your career. I, mean, I was just going to say that, you know, during this time of COVID, I feel like one thing that I've like, when, I, I feel like I've been asked this question a lot. And one thing that I like to kind of start off by saying is that what's been helping is taking time and realizing that productivity is not always key and top priority. And sometimes family is, sometimes health is, sometimes self-care is. Um, I feel like COVID has opened a lot opened my eyes to kind of how like capitalism and kind of this desire to continue to stay productive always drives a lot of us. Um, and so I guess for me, it's helped me to just really like um, prioritize things in my life that perhaps work was always prioritized on top of. But beyond that, also being able to engage with artists digitally has been really interesting. Before COVID, I did not know about Zoom, but I feel like I've been on Zoom every single day since. <laughs> Um, and I think studio visits take on a very different and like interesting light when you're not able to engage closely with the objects. And so just being able to have to, I feel like the conversation flows in a different way. And oftentimes I've found that it's gotten more personal when you don't have the object in front of you. Um, but yeah. Thank you for that. That's really yeah. an interesting perspective and I appreciate <laughs> That a lot. It but makes also, I can't speak to being a parent, so I know that that's a completely different, you know, <laughs> view of all of this to deal with little ones that are not in school and. Yeah. <laughs> the moment has highlighted consumption for me too in ways that you spoke to a little bit. Um, does anyone else have any strategies you'd like to share? Uh, I guess as also as a mom, I have a one-year-old, and so I'm kind of inherently already on a daily schedule, um, which is you know, not something I, I followed so strictly at work. I had a to-do list and I would meander between tasks or focus on something that was really time sensitive. But my daughter, you know, kind of my new director um, of my day has forced me to, I have these capsules of time or this is when I do this. This is when I contact artists. This is when I address email. And, um, you know, when it's hard to keep track of what day it is, I kind of find that I'm not normally a, a person who likes to be so rigid, but I'm finding that those boundaries are really helpful for me right now. Mm -hmm. well, and I'll checking in time, to yes, to take time for myself, to schedule that as well. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you sound like a great project manager. Um, yeah. <laughs> my staff a lot for um, you know different techniques with the schedule. Um, I find I'm working. A, um, I'm someone who's working a lot more, even like. There's not that differentiation between, for, for me, between um, my time at home and my time working. And I find myself working pretty late. And um, yeah, the boundaries are important to keep in mind as well. Um, does anyone else want to share a strategy before we move on? Yeah, um, sure. Um, you know, I, I'm still teaching. And so one of the things that I started thinking about is how this this concept has really changed the way I'm organizing and cataloging things. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm I'm a better um, uh, I have a better perception in how I'm cataloging my student work because it's in front of me, it's in a computer. So there's this sense of like this different aspect of archiving um, that I found. You know, it's just a, it's a, like a learning tool for me in some ways. But I also started thinking about um, just different ways of getting into 
artist studios like a voyeur using this screen it's so there's something so weird about it and i think i want to watch some hitchcock films um, just kind of like thinking the psychological boundaries we have as artists and as curators and and i don't know there's something so exciting about it you know and, and i always think of ways to kind of turn a bad situation into a productive situation you know just different kind of perspective I also um, piggybacking on what you were saying, I find that really interesting. And um, I, I also think it's a good time as curators to be cognizant and think about supporting art practices that occur outside the museum walls anyway, um, and supporting social practices. Um, because our spaces are physically closed, it seems like an ideal time to highlight and support practices that are you know, not reliant on opening and closing times. Um, so I found that to be interesting as well. Um, I'm going to ask Emily to transition now to share her desktop so we can share some of the images um, that we've all selected. Um, and the topic we're all responding to is about collaboration, and specifically collaborating across generations. Um, and if you could even at the end, um, as I, will, I will go in and I will add some credits. Um, and if you'd like to include any caption or credit information as your image scrolls through, feel free to do that. And the idea is to maybe take one minute for each image and describe it briefly to the group um, and how specifically it addresses, you know, this this topic of working across generations. So, um, Derecia, I see the images you selected are up first. Could you? Yes. So this is a photograph from Latoya Ruby Frazier's series, The Notion of Family. She, I was introduced to her work through this series where she photographed her family, specifically her mother, her grandmother and herself from 2001 to 2014. This image I selected is a photograph on a mantle or in a home space with figurines and frames. For me, and, and there are some other images that I really love from this series, but this sort of captures the sentiment of family and the generations and sort of the the, the energy that comes from the home. And I and I I think that it's there's just an intimacy and a personal perspective that you get when artists are working with within their family. Because I know that intergenerational can mean a few things with artists perhaps working together with art, other artists. But this is particularly looking at this, this artist's family, this woman's family as a legacy that she's really the only person that can approach it from this perspective. I don't know if perhaps any of the other curators can lend some commentary as to what this could, could, could speak to in terms of the intergenerational conversations and what that says about uh, this artist or this photographer and what she may be conveying. This is the first time, thank you for showing this, for choosing this image, Dracia. This is the first time I'm seeing this. Um, and I feel like just looking at it, one thing that kind of like stands out to me is the photograph on like the bottom right where it's the woman in the wine glass. Yeah. And it stands out to me because I have so many family members from like a certain generation who all of their wedding pictures are like them in this like wine glass, which I think is such like a funky aesthetic choice. Like, <laughs> but yeah. like, it definitely is kind of like, iconic of a particular generation and I feel like just having the image not have you know um living breathing subjects but kind of conveying generations through choices of photography and choices of trinkets and kind of how interiors are set up is really interesting exactly, it's yeah. all very nostalgic to me so I'm like that's kind of this yeah. is an interesting take on like kind of collaboration across generations and thinking how styles of photography have changed how making of the home has changed yeah <laughs> And it's definitely, I'm 
assuming that it's the grandmother's home or her mother's home where they all live. So when these photographs were taken again, it was a series of 13 years. I'm not sure the, the date of this one exactly, but I can see, I'm almost sure that either Latoya in the center or uh, a, a sister or a close relative, but it's just, um, and then the figurines as well, that definitely weren't, they weren't, they weren't, that, those weren't her choices in terms of what is in the house. I believe her mother, all, her grandmother collected dolls because she has other images in this series with just dozens and dozens of dolls in a room. Um, so it just sort of, I think another aspect of it is these reflections of, of Latoya within these photographs of her mother and of her grandmother and, and this, this sort of legacy, this visual legacy that she can have herself this sort of um I like to think of of DNA is sort of our mm -hmm. memory of generations hundreds of generations to pass because we can only maybe go two to five maybe generations back and, and even less when it comes to a visual image of these individuals so I just and and again I sort of took some liberty ginger when you share the topic, because I was like, really, I was thinking of more about artists who may work with other artists to produce work intergenerationally, but immediately this, this series popped into my head, so. I think it's really interesting, and it, it does, I, there's an interpretation I'm making with another artwork by a colleague of mine named Yasmin Nasser Diaz, um, oh. and she actually, um, recently did an installation that reminds me a lot of this and um, she has a, an exhibition at a museum that um, it's virtual now because the exhibition is closed but she um, created an installation which was a bedroom of two fictional sisters and this mm -hmm. actually reminds me a lot of that installation um, so that could be an interesting interpretation between those two artists as well um, but thank you so much for sharing can we go to your second image now This is uh, Micheline Thomas from her Waiting on a Primetime Star exhibit that was at Newcomb Art Museum at Tulane University in 2017. Again, anyone who's familiar with Micheline Thomas's work, she is frequently drawing on inspiration of her mother as her muse. And this image was curious to me because, again, it's sort of this. Uh, artists drawing on their legacy of family because ultimately we are sort of a result of where we came from so to speak so her using her mother as a muse here this work I believe was either uh, originally because this image there it's the 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 frame on the right is a video still that she that was also a photograph and that was also interpreted into this mixed media piece so it's sort of like these different ways that she photographed her mother she video recorded her mother in one of her signature interiors and then produced this mixed media work of her mom in the in the scene and it's just really very sassy to me it to me it's almost like Nicolene the way that she uses her mother as a muse it's almost like a, a self-portrait of sorts I, I feel like she she's um she honors her mother but I think she also perhaps sees a lot of her self in her mother because she just uses her really frequently in ways like you know, she has nude photographs of her mother and she just was seemed to be a very colorful personality um, and, and an inspirational personality and use for McLean. So I, I thought it was interesting that she had this, you know, you, you have this very bold red sweater and, and this sharp interior 
um, in the in the video and in the picture frame image. So this work was another that came to mind when we when when the topic popped in the inbox about uh, intergenerational works and artists because again Nicolene uses her mom frequently and definitely it's this bold loud very uh, signature to her uh, mixed media bead work that she does and I, I can sense because there was another exhibit um, bitter better nights where there were photographs of her mom and her mom's friends at late night parties and um, drag shows and things like that. So you just get a sense of this artist's experience growing up and the super vibrant community with, um, with her mother who was just based on the photographs and the images a very radiant, vibrant, live out loud personality that translates in Nicolene's work. I love this work. Thank you so much, Dericia. Um, it also makes me think um, about the subject of collaborating with family members. Um, I've always thought there's something curatorially that could be done with that. I can think of a lot of artists that I'm really interested in um, who collaborate with parents or children. Um, and I find that to be really fascinating. Like what does that relationship offer or what limitation exists there as a potential collaborator? Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Emily, could you uh, Emily, could you scroll to the next photograph now? Great. And now we're moving on to um, Katie Hirsch's um, images. Great. Um, well, I'm happy to share with you. This is an installation shot from an exhibition that actually was um, one of the last that we showed at the Halsey Institute before we closed our doors to the public. And I wanted to show, uh, this is work by Coulter Fussell, um, who is a quilt maker uh, living in Water Valley, Mississippi. And the exhibition was titled The Raw Materials of Escape. And Coulter created all new work for this exhibition over the period of a year. And um, I wanted to show an installation shot so that you can have kind of a sense of scale for the quilts and see how they relate to each other as well as far as the different, differenting, differentiating sizes and the um, dimensions as well. And when I heard the topic from Ginger about intergenerationality, I thought that quilt making is inherently um, intergenerational. Um, it's a craft, um, an art form that for uh, most of its existence had been passed down in the family, oftentimes from mother to daughter. Um, quilt making often being thought of as domestic women's work and kind of denigrated as such, when in fact uh, it's, it's an incredible, it takes an incredible skill, technical skill, um, and an artistic eye to be able to follow patterns, color balance, et cetera. So one thing I wanted to do with this exhibition was really highlight uh, the artistic qualities of quilt making. But Coulter is a really interesting artist because she both kind of honors and defies quilt making uh, in her practice. She's really technically observant of the rules that guide quilt making. Um, but as you might be able to see just from this shot, um, breaks all the rules at the same time um, and, and makes something kind of completely different. She learned to quilt from her mother, Kathy Fussell, who is herself a renowned quilt maker. Um, but again, she kind of <laughs> took what she learned from her mother and, and ran with it. Um, Coulter's work is interesting. All of this, all of the materials are found or donated. And so she's not just integrating, um, she integrates quilts that were made by her mother, for example, or objects made um, by friends or other family over the years, but also by uh, anonymous women um, over multiple generations who made quilts. She uses antique quilts um, from the 19th century, for example, and kind of gives voice to the work of those women through her own. Uh, pieces. Um, Katie, we actually, I, I curated um, um, <laughs> Coulter's uh, yes. work in uh, an exhibition called Kin, mm -hmm. along with her mother's work. Yes. 
the um, <laughs> when I saw you were participating, I thought, oh, no, I that's you. right. Yeah, because Coulter <laughs> grew up in Columbus, Georgia. Right. And I'm really good friends with her mother. Um, I, and I think I believe is it true that uh, she hand quilts all of her. Yes. Work? Yes, she hands pieces, hand stitches. Um, yeah. She works in a really interesting way on the floor, um, piecing her materials together before she even cuts anything. Everything goes on the floor. She thinks about her work in a really interesting way. She describes it that she paints or she quilts in a painting way, and yeah. she makes quilts that are paintings and paintings that are quilts. Mm -hmm. And I think even from this shot, you can see the balance of light and dark. Um, that she looks at particularly. Thank you for bringing that up, Hannah. Yeah, sure. And I think, um, and just talking about intergenerational, mm -hmm. um, I I remember in an interview with Kathy Fussell, uh, her mother, uh, she talks about how her, she learned quilting and sewing from her grandmother, yeah. and and this line of women who have you know learned craft passing down from one generation to another. Yeah, it's, yeah. and I think it's also really beautiful hearing Coulter talk about being able to see almost the personalities of women who've worked on quilts, those that she knows and those that she doesn't. One of these quilts um, in the center there that has all of the rings at the top, that was a quilt made by her mother, Kathy Fussell, when Kathy was 16. Wow. And um, she talked, Coulter talks about being able to see in a woman's stitches, you know, if she was really showing off, making these really tight stitches, feeling really good that day, uh, or if she was just making something for somebody to sleep under and was didn't want to be there. Um, so I think Coulter talking, like, yeah, giving voice to these women through um, observing their stitches. A lot of times she'll go over the stitches and emphasize the pattern or she'll spray paint uh, a stitching pattern that she can see. Um, so again, really highlighting the work. Um, Does she understand her practice as existing in um, kind of a sort of lineage, um, I guess, mm -hmm. carrying on this kind of Southern craft tradition or does she kind of separate her practice from that? Um, she definitely identifies as, as a quilter. She says, I'm an artist, I make quilts. So <laughs> it's, it's important to her to be recognized as an artist because so often, uh, f throughout much of art history, quilt makers were something other, right? I think mm -hmm. craft continues to face this challenge. Um, so she does see herself in that in that lineage, but uh, she recognizes also that um, she's also outside of it, and that some quilt makers might not want her to be <laughs> seen in that vein. Um, it's interesting that I hear her say, um, you know, making this relationship between quilting and painting. Um, and I think with value that you can really see that. Um, but, but in another image I saw of the show um, when I was researching her work as well, um, it seemed very sculptural to me. The piece with the blue um, fabric it seemed like it was almost exploding at the top. Um, so I think there's, to me, I think textiles take on also a feeling of spatial presence that's really unique as well. Um, so it's interesting because I see a lot of sculpture in her work. Um, Absolutely. And, and she would say that as well. You know, a quilt is inherently sculptural because that also bends and folds. Um, here we've displayed them on the wall flat. Um, but, you know, when you're holding it, when you're interacting with it, it's inherently figural because it's made in the dimensions of the human body. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's everything. Coulter would say it's everything. And these, this, this slide you can see here, that sculptural quality that you're referring to, Ginger, um, with the chickens <laughs> coming out uh, in the image on, on the left and the fur um, on, the, on the quilt called the bear on the right. And Coulter, um, still though thinking about painting, she was thinking about pushing the idea of foreground and background in the quilt and um, by integrating these 3D elements was able to kind of break that that plane between the viewer and the, the quilt. Thank you so much. I love this work. Um, I think it's just a phenomenal show. Um, is it virtual open virtually now or did the show already close? The show closed uh, right at the end of February, but oh. um, on the Halsey website, we've got all the installation photos. Amazing. Great work. Um, OK, can we now go to the next image, Emily? 
That's me, I guess. <laughs> So um, uh, I'm going to talk about an artist who actually I met um, during my exhibition in, uh, at the Kentler uh, International Drawing Center in New York. And, um, and then recently I, um, um, I heard a conversation with her and Jonathan Waltz at the Columbus, uh, the Columbus Museum. Um, her show opened during just at the cusp of um, when they closed down the museum because of the COVID-19. So we have, I haven't really seen this exhibition yet, but I have been an admirer of her work for a while. Um, and uh, so when uh, Ginger asked to talk about someone who's inter, you know, generational and uh, cross inter cross-cultural um, artists, I, I immediately thought, uh, thought about her work and, um, I'm just getting familiar with her work, but I'm really intrigued about where she's coming from. So um, this uh, is uh, Nancy Friedman Sanchez. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with her work. Um, she's influenced by minimalism and decorative um, art and design, but um, her work really start, came from originally from um, I think the complexity of the relationship um, which she had with her grandma grandmother who taught her how to crochet. And um, so she started making these large elaborate um, works based on um, uh, you know, crochet work. And the work that you're seeing before you is uh, one of our recent work. Um, from her cornucopia uh, series, and it's inspired by a Spanish colonialism um, that's called, the, the process is called mopa mopa. It's a process using a natural resin um, that's still indigenous Colombian um, artists are using, and um, which also mimics this um, idea of uh, Chinese lacquer. Um, these are large pieces that uh, also is comprised of um, uh, collage and paintings. Um, and uh, I, I wish I had a better image to, see, to show you how large these images are. But um, one of the things that I thought was um, that made me think of her in her work, because um, I like in, in my own work, I investigate a lot of language and the way language has crossed um, through multi cultures and, you know, being an immigrant um, and uh, which my background is Filip in Filipino, um, I sort of have this uh, I lineage and heritage that comes from many different cross cultures like Spanish um, and, you know, Castilian Spanish that goes into South American Spanish and then goes into the Pacific Island influence colonial Spanish and then all these cross cultural um, uh, after that like Chinese and you know anything that makes up my own DNA and um, she also talks about this hybridity between how we cross culture and the way our, our, our heritage connects together makes up who we are. And so I really thought that um, the way she explores that visually and conceptually in her work um, is uh, intriguing to me. And um, in the way she implements some of these um, visual meaning in her work, even though it's, um, you know, it, it, in a way, it's very decorative, and sometimes we think of old. It, she brings it into a contemporary language and context. Um, uh, and in here, you'll see, in, in this series of cornucopia works, you'll see a variety of these um, collage um, in, the, in the gallery where, you know, she puts in different uh, types of flowers and birds from different cultures um, that she's been through in her life. Um, and the, something that's, um, you know, it, she, she talks about how 
her um, lineage comes from Spanish, um, you know, Asian, indigenous, uh, Colombian, and um, and how that has been the most influential things that she creates her own um, her own language with her visual language. Um, Hannah, you said something to me um, in your email about using aesthetic language as a political tool. I thought that was really interesting. Um, could you say a little bit about that before we transition to the next image? Sure. Um, so one of the things that um, in her work that, that I find intriguing is that she uses some um, the um, some of the, the decorative aspects that's been used in other political um, um, you know, like architecture designs and and then, you know, or some of the patterns that she uses are also reflective of the uh, political um, aspect of where these things come from. Like she looks at Moorish uh, patterns, a Spanish patterns, and she brings these into the work um, and uses it as, a, as an aesthetic tool to critique sort of these boundaries between cultures. Thank you for introducing me to the work. I'm really um, happy that I got this introduction and I'm going to take this as an opportunity to learn more about it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and me too. I, I, I have so much to learn uh, about her work and thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about her. Okay, um, Emily, can we go to the next image now? Great. So we have three images from Nzinga. Um, yeah. Emily, could you do me a favor and tell me what the next one is? I just want to know in what order I should, I guess, frame this. Of course. So it's Eric Mack next. Okay, cool. So Christo. I guess I took a little bit of liberty when Ginger brought up the idea of kind of collaboration across generations. Um, and rather than um, pick one work that kind of spoke to multiple generations, I picked a series of works um, from the exhibition that I curated, Unbound, that kind of looks at the history of um, Black artists working in an abstract language. I um, mean, it kind of talks about um, um, Black abstraction existing in a sort of lineage or continuum, beginning with people like Romery Bearden and ending with more contemporary people. Um, this particular slide is an image of Joe Overstreet's 1970 work in, called Untitled. Um, in 1970s, as we know, it's like a heady political moment, and it was a moment in time where African American artists in particular were often kind of burdened with this task of creating um, politically poignant works, um, works that were kind of legibly understood as being political, and a lot of times um, abstract language was just not um, understood um, to be kind of in support of that um, aim. And so I kind of chose this because um, in thinking about kind of the pushback that Joe Overstreet got at that time um, using abstraction and kind of how he pushed back at even kind of um, the more ardent supporters of the Black arts movement who believed that abstraction was too illegible a language to kind of speak to the struggle towards Black freedom. He kind of instead employed this abstract language and kind of um, affirmed its place in kind of speaking um, to those issues. Um, so for one, the I don't know if you guys can tell, but the work is um, very sculptural and that it's tethered to the wall in um, seven points, I believe. And he talked about the tension of those ropes kind of alluding to lynching in the United States at that time and kind of the terror of lynching. Um, he talks about kind of the triangular forms as alluding to tent-like um, forms and, um, and he kind of presented them as a commentary on himself feeling like a nomad amidst kind of racial insensitivity in the country during the 1970s. And so you can see how he's kind of using this very abstract language, but making it kind of directly um, related to like the lives and experiences of um, Black people. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk about this intergen intergenerational dialogues or kind of like um, cross-generational collaboration, because while he was making this work in the 1970s and pushing against these ideas that abstraction was too illegible of a language to speak to these issues, um, generations and generations later, 21st century contemporary African-American artists kind of didn't have to deal with those particular questions. I feel like um, artists like, if we could go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. 
I feel like artists like um, and Eric Mack is a really good example of how he kind of um, employs the language of abstraction and doesn't have to, he doesn't, he, his um, use of abstraction to kind of um, comments on contemporary realities is not questioned. Um, and so this work is a work by um, New York-based artist Eric Mack, and it's called Blue Duet One. There's one right next to it called Blue Duet Two that I don't think I sent in an image of. Um, but again, you can kind of see like similarly to Joe Overstreet's work in form, he's using um, these kind of like, he's kind of using this GM, these like large swaths of color. Um, he's tethering his paintings and he does understand these works just like Joe Overstreet did as paintings and not necessarily as sculptures. So just kind of the idea that he's kind of taking, he's kind of building on, you know, kind of understanding Joe Overstreet's practice and understanding that kind of painting does not have to exist in this, um, traditional format um, and I and other 21st century contemporary artists kind of again I feel like um, practice has thrived because of the seeds that these earlier artists in the 1970s and even earlier planted <coughs> and we can go to the final work I can't even remember which one it is. oh cool Krista Clark's work um, this is an installation that she did for the exhibition um, and it's called sheltered, um, and she kind of her practice as a whole um, is use it, it uses found objects and source objects um, as a way to kind of comment on the homogenization of urban spaces throughout the country. Um, she's an Atlanta-based artist, so her work I feel like is kind of particularly relevant to the city of Atlanta. Um, I live in the West End, and I can and I kind of it resonated with me because I see stacks of wood and kind of cords and different the, the forms that she uses in her work I see directly kind of in my everyday visual landscape. Um, I also brought up this image because I think that it does a really good job of illustrating kind of the intergenerational um, um, inter intergenerational dialogues and um, multi-generational conversations. When when I talk in the gallery about Joe Overstreet's work, I always kind of talk about the triangular forms that he alluded to um, these nomadic structures, but Krista Clark, on the other hand, literally takes a nomadic structure and mounts it on the wall. So if you can see in the right of the picture um, is an orange tent that's like mounted vertically on the wall with a slab of concrete slid inside and like a light fixture inside of it. Um, I don't know if that's hard to visualize. I feel like I've seen it so much that like in my head, it's so it's crystal clear, but this image may not be as clear as it is in the installation in person. Um, but yeah, just the idea that Joe Overstreet was using this abstract language and kind of used the triangular form as a way to allude to this kind of feeling of being a nomad. And Krista Clark in talking about nomad, you know, talking about gentrification and kind of how um, people in Atlanta are being forced to kind of live this nomadic life, literally inserted, you know, um, a physical nomadic structure in her work. So. I guess that was kind of a different take on the idea of intergenerational conversations, but just the idea that, you know, art isn't created in a vacuum and, you know, artists obviously are inspired and kind of um, grow from the roots and the seeds that were planted from earlier artists. Um, I feel like with this, with this exhibition, it gave me an opportunity to kind of have the experience of working with artists from different generations and when I say that I mean digging in the archives and then also talking to living artists and I feel like those are two very different experiences but it showed me that um, I feel like that you should engage with them both um, on a, in a similar way in the same way that you should really dig into the artists to kind of see what their intent was and what their understanding of their own practice is that's the sort of, that's kind of the same way that I dug into someone like Romarie Bearden's work um, to try and understand how he thought about his practice and how he kind of conceptualized it. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm rambling now. <laughs> I, I, I like your take on um, that concept, Nzinga. It's really kind of refreshing to kind of have this over broad view of, you know, uh, going from Romare Bearden, Crystal's work, like it's, it's really such a nice view and concept. And I can now look at it and see those things happening. <laughs> Um, I think Nzinga's show really pushed the idea of abstraction and um, question um, art historical knowledge and canons about art history relating to abstraction. Um, I think it's a really important show. Um, thank you so much, Nzinga, for sharing this and also for, for joining us today. Oh, um, fun. Okay, can we move to the next image, Emily? 
Okay, um, so I'm going to go through very quickly, um, but this is actually a working image I had in my personal files um, from a curatorial residency I did many years ago. Um, but this piece is a video by an artist named Francesca Dubrock, um, and it's a work she was living in Mexico City at the time. Um, but I know Francesca very well, and she was actually one of my first graduate students when I first began teaching at San Francisco Art Institute. Um, it's interesting to mention San Francisco Art Institute now because they're one of the, the institutions that has um, really, um, they closed during COVID mm -hmm. after something like 90 something years of being a functional art school. Um, but that's where I first started teaching. And so um, this work was a work by a former student of mine. Um, and in looking back through my notes and my records from this period, which, I mean, it, it's dated. It's not um, a work, uh, a show I've curated recently at all. But um, in my notes, um, well, this show is titled A Candle in Four Parts. Um, and that's what the exhibition title was. Um, however, in my notes, I noticed a working title was called Time is Material. Um, and I, I was like, why did I... Why did I decline that title in the end? <laughs> but um, I think using time and using history as a kind of conceptual subject um, as a curator is something I've revisited in various ways throughout my career. Um, in this exhibition, another piece by Francesca Dubrock um, was a, a, a work that included a sculpture that was a radio that had recordings from her father. So I think artists in this exhibition were examining um, generational knowledge in different ways. Um, another thing that I was trying to do with this show was I was trying to question the kind of clock time or the kind of durational idea of an exhibition as a finished work. Um, and this is an exhibition that rotated once a week. Um, and so there was an aspect of the work and the kind of narrative and story um, that you encountered when you went through the space. Um, that changed throughout the exhibition. So, um, you know, just in going through my records and my art, my own archival material recently, this is a show that really stood out to me as something that's still relevant in some ways. Um, um, can we go to the next slide, Emily? And I wanted to bring up this piece as well. Um, and this is a different way of, of thinking about um, artists who work with history and time. Uh, but this is a work by an artist who's primarily a sculptor and installation artist named Amanda Ross Ho. Um, Amanda Ross Ho currently lives in California, but I met her in Chicago when we were both quite young. And um, this is a piece that's kind of unusual for her. Um, I'm just going to describe it briefly, but it's actually a quilt that's made of drop cloths from her studio. And um, she made it with her aunt. So um, she salvaged the materials and my understanding was mailed it back and forth um, out of state with her aunt to make this mm -hmm. piece work. Um, one of the things I really loved about this piece um, is that because it, the, the materials and the fabrics were made from drop, drop cloths and um, kind of like rags from her studio, um, I like the idea of incorporating a process that had typically been discarded um, and moving it into the central content of the work. So bringing like peripheral materials from studio practice into the central content of the work is something that I was interested in. Um, this was part of a show I curated in December um, of this year. So this is a more recent project, but it was a textile show that I think did work um, with really theories of women and handcraft and labor, as well as technology. and. Um, Really, I think I was using these works as a way to talk about labor. Um, and another artist in the show was Sabrina Geschwantner, um, whose work um, really spoke to the idea of tactile knowledge. Just another thing I wanted to mention about this piece is that um, it was a show primarily of textiles and quilts, but I did have this one on the ground. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because I wanted to have the perspective of approaching a quilt in the way you would in another setting where you're looking down on the plane instead of out. Um, so I just wanted to mention that these are two um, images that really stood out to me. Um, Emily, could you go to the next slide now and we'll move to the next person? Oh, great. 
Well, it's hard to go after all those wonderful images. Thank you guys so much for sharing that information. It was really incredible. Um, so this is an image by a Dutch photographer, uh, Hendrik Kirstens, and this is a photograph that's in Telfair Museum's permanent collection. And it's one of those images that, you know, has constantly slid by my radar several times, and I'm always really captivated by it and uh, finally have an uh, opportunity to use it in an upcoming exhibition that I'm hopefully opening this fall. It's had a few changes um, in the last few weeks, but we'll see. Uh, that exhibition is focused on uh, photographs of children, mostly from the permanent collection. So it's called Youthful Adventures Growing Up in Photography. And so that's another kind of interesting generational thing is thinking about, you know, the how and why images of children often resonate so strongly with us. Um, this one's interesting, I think, because it calls uh, to attention a lot of the kind of familial threads that we had already been speaking about with some of the other images, but it's a father taking photographs of his daughter, Paula, um, throughout the years. So he began the series in 1995 and continues it to this day. So it's the examination of time and growing up through photography um, and kind of the you know connection that he made with her you know he quit his job to stay at home with her and um i guess you know consider that a reversal of traditional roles and this was his way of kind of connecting with her at that time um and i love it because you know it's it's him trying to gain access to her a little bit and there is kind of an you know it's harder to um understand her expression and see beyond what she's only offering to the camera but there is this wonderful sense of playfulness that's also in the images and that she has this um, plastic bag on her head and in, in lieu of you know what might be a traditional kind of lace bonnet so they're playing with this shared cultural history that they have through um, Dutch portraiture that they're looking at so I like the idea of kind of that older generation looking to the younger generation and then looking back you know generally generationally through history um, at images that kind of matter to them. Erin, is this an artist from the Southeast? It is not, no. Okay. <laughs> it's Dutch artist. Artist from your collection? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, this was a lot of material, and I really appreciate all, you know, everyone running through their images. Um, Emily, could you transition out of your desktop now? Oh. Um, so I had two prompts. I'm going to go ahead and um, finish up with them now. Um, one is that I was thinking in this topic about um, artists who use history as a kind of conceptual material. Um, I think there's a lot of places to go with this and also a lot of um, things that came up during the conversation um, where we were referencing images from our own curatorial projects. It really brought up to me a lot about um, supporting mid-career artists as well, um, which is one thing I think about as a curator, there's a huge emphasis on funding emerging artists um, in, with grants nationally. And um, I also notice in museums, there's an emphasis on repeating already canonized or institutionalized artists in um, large scale traveling exhibitions. Um, but I always thought there was something really useful and meaningful about supporting mid-career artists too. Um, so in just looking at these images, I was also thinking about um, where these artists come from in different phases of their career. Um, but I did notice a lot of the artists are engaging history as a kind of conceptual material. And I was wondering if anyone wanted to speak to that a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll, add, a, I'll, I'll add something um, about um, Nancy uh, Freeman Sanchez's work. Um, I know, you know, it, in her work, she dives into so much about not just her inf the influence of her grandmother generationally, but really her background in um, uh, in cross cultural background in Latin American and Asian African and indigenous tribes, like in the work that I showed uh, that Emily showed earlier, um, you know that that was really referenced um, in the history of indigenous Colombian cultural tradition. And, and without that, it wouldn't, like she wouldn't really capture this notion and connectivity with the work itself, you know, and these are really important. Uh, she also talks about like how the, um, 
the collage references the original process and um, um, the original process and expresses the visual representation of Spanish colonialization in the work. Um, and, you know, I think that um, history really plays a part in how we identify as human beings. And in, you know, going to the work with the Dutch uh, photographer, Aaron, you know, it's really kind of this idea, this nice idea of reflecting that cultural um, boundaries that they have with the father and daughter, but then also reflecting their own traditional history within that, that culture. I mean, did, did you get that sort of it, when you're looking at that artist's work? Oh yeah, definitely. I would uh, completely agree with that statement. That that's something that they're referencing um, in in many ways. Okay. Yeah, that kind of like brought to mind Kehinde Wiley's work for me. Just the way that it was staged in this very kind of like, I don't know, just Dutch old, <laughs> you know, way. But it, she's very obviously a very contemporary looking woman with like the black turtleneck, and then obviously like the plastic and all of these like kind of ideas about consumption came to mind just right. because like of the over the single use plastic that was in our hair but then it also kind of like the sheerness of it alluded to some sort of like veil or bonnet or something so it was really interesting um and thinking about artists who use history as conceptual material it kind of brings to mind also um in the slide that emily showed um while i was talking to joe overstreet mm -hmm. and how he kind of is using this um abstract and language to talk about kind of like heady things that have happened in history and i think that that's kind of particularly relevant right, right now because there are a lot of artists who are using kind of um like the the Black Lives Matter moment and this kind of like very political moment that's happening right now and kind of making these very visceral visceral works of art kind of responding to that and I wonder how like when those become history how we'll kind of remember this moment and um and what are ways that kind of abstraction or other more conceptual forms of art can move us away from those images and kind of present them in a way that um, is less traumatic. I don't know why that brought those things to mind, but. <laughs> That's interesting because it makes me think too how we're always drawing parallels to history, you know, things that are happening now to history. And, you know, because right now when we think of COVID, everyone references the 1918, you know, Spanish mm -hmm. influenza. And we always find those moments of connection in the past to bring to the present. And yeah, how we'll think of the present in the future will become our past. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's something innately didactic about using history where there's kind of a lesson there that again like what you're saying Erin that calls to how do we relate this path to what's happening now or a potential future because anytime you anytime an artist is using history it there is like a lesson to be learned there there's a a Google search or, you know, an encyclopedia at some point for, for us to, to see what the artist is, is pointing to or, or asking us to pay attention to. Um, Dury, this is a great opportunity to um, transition to uh, the last prompt or mm -hmm. question, um, which was really about, it. which has to be more about engaging audiences as curators um, and how, and I've noticed personally that um, the way, for example, I teach um, has changed a little over the past decade. Um, since I began teaching, um, students have different access to immediate information with things like iPhones. Um, and then I also notice, even in looking back at some of the shows I've curated, um, that I'm trying to engage audiences in different ways. So I thought maybe we could end by talking about how we're maybe strategies or tactics, maybe subversive tactics we use to engage different generations um, in our exhibitions. Are you talking about virtually or? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I wasn't, that wasn't what I was thinking, uh, yeah. but I'm happy to, you know, include that in the conversation because, it, wow, I mean, that's a total that's, Yeah. Change. When I, when I started curating and when I, even when I was teaching, curatorial studies, it the idea of, you know, managing spaces that are physically closed didn't really 
<laughs> come up that much. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of unprecedented or new information, which is why I went back in the beginning to this idea of really using this time to support artistic practices that are happening outside of the museum walls anyway. I think that's one really useful thing we can do during this time. Um, but I like the idea of, of in incorporating virtual you know, exhibitions and new techniques into the conversation. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll just start maybe uh, going into that public art uh, display. Um, so recently, one of the um, question is, how do we exhibit student artwork? Or, or how do we, you know, um, that are going through their BFA thesis? And so I got a, a phone call from a community supporter and was like, how, how can the Do Good Fund um, support your students who are graduating. It, you know, they, they're getting the bad end of this. They're not going to be able to exhibit their work. They've been working on for four years being in school and so forth. And, um, it, you know, and, and we, we went back and forth and talked about different strategies. And of course, we like everyone else, we were going to do this exhibit online, maybe a virtual gallery, what that means and or just showing images um, sort of like it's a catalog. And uh, so um, the the uh, Do Good, um, Alan Rothschild, who runs the Do Good um, uh, Fund, which is a uh, um, collection of photography um, by artists from all over the world, photographer about the South. It's an incredible um, non-for-profit. And um, he was like, why don't we do a public art of their work? And at first I was like, oh no, you know, like having people touch each other, be with each other. And, and so we started, you know, thinking about doing just a public display of their images of their work. Now there's two folds in that, that was very interesting. One is that in the times, in the situation that we're in now, when everything is closed, that when you give somebody something to look at outside. The, re the reaction was so amazing. I mean, people are really needing something. And, and so that's, I guess that's one of the things that kind of triggered me to think, it is important, these institutional things that we're in are so important. This is, tactility is very important, you know? So, but then we are now in this uh, regrouping to think about different ways in how we're going to interact after COVID-19. And, um, you know, and I'm not sure about the virtual showing. I don't feel it. I don't know about you guys. It, I don't, I, I'm not into it, but, and I have not seen anything that I felt like um, genuine or, or, you know, at all. I, and I'd like to hear from some of you. Sure. I mean, we also had um, at the Halsey Institute, we closed right before we were supposed to open our student, our annual student exhibition as well, um, which was in its 35th year. And um, students really look forward to being selected. It's a juried exhibition. And of course, it was really disappointing for them. And we were, we mounted a virtual exhibition in Art Steps. Um, and which allows you to kind of, you know, as much as you can simulate the experience of moving around mm -hmm. a gallery. Uh, and we, we were anxious about the response from students and, you know, of course they're disappointed, but uh, we were interested to hear from some of them that they were really excited because they said, you know, oh, our grandparents, my grandparents always wanted to be able to come or it was gonna be cost prohibitive for my parents to come and see my, my work. And, um, that this actually turned into a conversation about accessibility for us and um, which we hadn't really expected. And so uh, we are exploring other ways to expand our virtual footprint beyond archiving our exhibition um, that we, we might be exploring this summer or this fall, uh, putting things online, um, perhaps not with art steps, <laughs> thinking about it <laughs> in, in a different way. Um, but now having it be a conversation about, yeah, accessibility, we're free, we're open to the public. So that um, is, is 
some not something that would be a barrier, but there's, you know, the bus ticket to get there, the plane ticket to get there, the hours, the work that, you know, is during your work hours. So online offerings um, are something we hope to explore. Yeah. Well, I'd love to end there. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for giving your time. Um, the thought behind this was really to build community and to support other curators and for women to support each other in the field. Um, so I hope, um, thank you for all this time and I hope that um, the conversations continue um, amongst yourselves or um, maybe more one-to-one -one pairings would be great. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much.